Notice I've added Leipzig to the, uh, uh, to the Weimar, but oh. uh, let me begin Sorry. then with two passages from letters by Wagner. And I'm afraid that in, in one case, I have to use the German words, and I'll be, tr in some cases, translating. Such Schweinereien can only occur under the ages of a complete Schwachkopfes und Hosenscheißers, <laughs> number one. Do, there is no adequate... <laughs> there is no adequate word of disdain to express my disgust with it. Dummheit, cowardice, and uh, coarseness all together. If, if I were to tell you that Wagner was writing these words, words about a journal and its editor, you might well imagine that he aimed them at the oppositional Niederrheinische Musikzeitung under its arch-conservative edi editor Ludwig Bischoff or the equally hostile Zignala with editor Edward Bernsdorf, who had taken serious offense over Das Judentum in der Musik. That's, the, that's his uh, Gegenschrift. But no, Wagner aimed these colorful barbs from 1851 and 52 at Franz Brendel and his Neue Zeitschrift für Musik, which August Reismann's Allgemeine Deutsche Geschichte der Musik from 1864 called a Wagnerian, quote, party organ of the worst kind, der niedersten Sorte, and which Wagner scholars have tended to unproblematically portray as, par uh, as party organ for a united collegial progressive movement. Granted that Wagner's frank correspondence with Theodor Uhlig, um, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, featured such polemics on a regular basis that the cautious Brendel only took a definitive stand in support of Wagner at the beginning of 1852, and that the composer himself would opportunistically make use of the journal, we still cannot ignore these and similar passages in the composer's letters to Uhlig and Karl Ritter, and also to Franz Liszt and Brendel about his Weimar and Leipzig apologists. Taken as a whole, his accusations of mispromotion that aimed themselves at the list Brendel progressive camp, namely Brendel, Joachim Roth, Louis Kurler, the Neue Zeitschrift in general, and even List himself, merit serious con consideration. Indeed, just over two weeks after, Bren after Brendel's publication of Das Judentum in der Musik, Wagner could assert and I was told I could use this word. It's a real piece of shit, this journal, but faute de mieux, you accept it, end quote. What is the source of Wagner's conflict with the promotional powerhouse of the Leipzig-Weimar axis, which helped to bring his music, thought, and name into German musical discourse in the early 1850s? To understand the problem, it is necessary to delve into the background of the journals and its editor's position on Wagner. Already in 1846, Brendel had taken a qualified stand on Wagner when he wrote the following in a Neue Zeitre footnote to an article about the development of opera, quote, Wagner's efforts appear to me to be quite noteworthy in some ways, end quote. The Neue Zeitschrift did not specifically take up Wagner again until 1850, and then it was not Brendel but Uhlig who broke the journal's lance for the composer. Indeed, violinist and Wagner friend Uhlig was the one Neue Zeitschrift contributor whose work found Wagner's full approbation. His activity as the composer's publicity agent took off in 1850, the time that Nicholas Vachonnier identifies as the birth of the Wagner industry. Brendel's Nachruf, Nachruf for Uhlig from January 21st, 1853, recalls how Schumann had introduced him to Uhlig and argues that he, Brendel had suggested in 1849 to, uh, to Uhlig that he take up the pen on behalf of Wagner. Now, I have my doubts about this, but we can discuss it at another time. Among other factors, the editor's own public position on the composer was by no means unequivocal until 1852. 
Ulig and Wagner stood alone in the journal's um, Wagner promotion until Brendel's cautious essay of, 18, of June 20th, 1851, Einige Worte über er Wagner. As Vachonnier observes, during the period from early 1850 through the end of 1852, Wagner and Ulig literally filled the pages of the Neue Zeitschrift with Wagner propaganda. Ulig had joined the journal's masthead and staff in the second half of 1849 with a Wagnerian article series about musical meter, influenced by Wagner, followed by the January 1850 essays on Beethoven that, as Vachonny has argued, all but plagiarized Wagner, albeit avant la lettre. Um, this was followed by his work in the important September 3rd issue. Um, and do take a look. This is, I've excerpted the masthead here. You can see then that besides the intelligence blot, there are only two other items, which is a first for the Neue Zeitschrift. And, uh, it was, yeah, so it consisted solely of, but this is interesting because Ulig then is the counterpart to Das Judentum in der Musik, uh, where you have Ulig's review, the first installment of Ulig's review of the Weimar performance of Lohengrin and Wagner's Das Judentum. Brendel may not have been strongly convinced of the Wagner cause at the time, but he knew what made for striking journalism. Indeed, just two weeks earlier, Ulig's extended series on Wagner's writings had begun to appear, which carried into 1851 and 52 and became his primary legacy in matters of Wagner. As mentioned, Brendel himself adopted a cautious approach towards putting his and the journal's cultural capital behind the composer, even as others, Ulig, Hans von Bülow, and Liszt, took up the cause. Not only Brendel's restraint bothered Wagner, but also the editor's openness to presenting opposing viewpoints, which the composer regarded as inconsistency in partisanship. A dedicated supporter of the revolutions of 1848 and an ardent Hegelian, Brendel believed that progress, i.e. a synthesis of opposing viewpoints, can only be accomplished through open dialogue. Already in his first issue of the Neue Zeitschrift from January 1st, 1845, Brendel uh, established, um, sorry, Brendel established this principle for the journal, the highlighted portion here, calm and impartial opposition of various viewpoints. When in October 1850, he published the critical responses by Eduard Krüger and Eduard Bernsdorf to Das Judentum in der Musik, Brendel's Anmerkung to the former clearly expresses his rationale for presenting the article and the responses to it. Quote, however, it is our endeavor to increasingly inspire a free exchange of ideas, a lively reciprocity in the area of music called forth by encouragement in all directions, breaking the power of rigid prejudices, end quote. Such offenses against his own drive for self-promotion rankled Wagner, who complained to Ulig that Brendel, quote, says yes today and no tomorrow, end quote, and might publish excerpts from Oper und Drama in one issue and then attack him in the next. In fact, though, one could argue that Brendel was constructing a dialectic between Wagner and his opponents, with the outcome in his own synthetic work of reconciling the two parties' aesthetic positions according to his perception. E.g., you could have both your Gesamtkunst and Eat your Sonderkunst? Well, <laughs> you get where I'm driving. <laughs> you, you could have both under the same hat. Brendel's unequivocal statement of support from January 1st, 1852, caused Wagner to make public his concerns over music, uh, over music journalism. And thus, in February, the New Neue Zeitschrift published an open letter to Brendel, significantly without any editorial commentary by Brendel himself. Wagner argued that the role of the critic is to ex exercise, quote, a healthy, strongly felt revolutionary criticism with the most ruthless candor, end quote. 
Wagner claims to have searched in vain for a journal that would meet his requirements. So he used what was there, and then, quote, as good as was possible, eben so gut wie es ging. However, the editor's recent position taking had raised the expectation that the journal will purify itself of the commercial element and the Sonderkunst and will promote, quote, the most intimate union of Dichtkunst and Tonkunst while making this Kunstwerk der Zukunft the subject of every literary expression. The editor did take some measures to satisfy the composer's demands, yet also remained true to his own promotional beliefs and aesthetic principles. He removed two of the lingering Schumannists, Wagner's term, in particular Zurich correspondent August Hitchhold, whose insipid reports, again Wagner's designation, had served as one of the composer's immediate incentives for the open letter, as well as the editor's perceived inconsistency. Wagner had directly complained to Brendel in January 1852, shouldn't I, excuse me, shouldn't I actually justifiably write against your paper instead of against the Grenzboten, since it is at least consistent in its narrow-minded position, end quote. Nevertheless, in the New Year's article one year later, Brendel argued, if we really want to be of use, we must make concessions here and there, and may not proceed everywhere with the bluntest consistency, end quote. This meant that, yeah, uh, whoops, that Brendel's own, uh, sorry, this meant that Brendel's own primary contribution to the Wagner debates, his appraisal of the opera writings, the six part Die bisherige Sonderkunst und das Kunstwerk der Zukunft from 1853, would attempt to correct and in reinterpret Wagner to temper his extreme position that deterred political. Uh, potential supporters. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Leading the, the list of composer Schroffheiten was the, in was the decisive misjudgment of the, quote, profoundly based necessity, the justification of the Sonderkunst, end quote. For Brendel, the concert life of his time required reform, not abolition. It stands to reason that Wagner could not accept such criticism, writing disapprovingly to Liszt that, quote, Brendel and his colleagues have not understood, have not at all read my writings in the way they must be read in order to be understood, end quote. In turn, Brendel expressed to Liszt his own displeasure over Wagner. Wag, quote, Wagner makes the mistake of believing that those who follow in his footsteps best understand him while he explains differing viewpoints as absence of understanding. However, you have to deviate from Wagner in some points so that something will come of it, end quote. In other words, Brendel and Wagner occupied two seemingly irreconcilable positions on how to best serve the cause of Wagner. Brendel's article series accompanied the increasing promotional activity of the Weimar Circle of Apologists, which Liszt had been assembling since 1847. The shift in publicity from Wagner-based to Liszt-based becomes apparent if we compare mastheads between uh, volume 37, late 1852, and 41, late 1854. It's a little bit hard to see, but the latter with four writer critics from Weimar, by far the largest contingent of collaborators on the journal, including Leipzig and Berlin. The shift in, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, this late arrival of Liszt's Weimar forces to the debates reflects Brendel's even greater reluctance to openly support what Liszt had stood for. It was not until 1850 that the Neue Zeitschrift reported on Liszt other than as a virtuoso, and then surprisingly through the pen of Ulig, who wrote at length about the premiere of Lohengrin and reported favorably on Liszt's activities in Weimar. For the first years of the 1850s, Liszt stood under the shadow of Wagner in the Neue Zeitschrift. 
Thus, in the important direction-setting New Year's article from 1853, Brendel did not mention Liszt or Weimar at all, but rather reaffirmed and strengthened his Wagner confession. It should not surprise us, then, that the early promotional activities from Weimar directed themselves towards supporting Wagner, at least in the national forum of the Neue Zeitschrift. Liszt had not intentionally attracted young critics to Weimar, that several of these pupils and musicians could also write about music, though, was to his advantage. Even as Liszt set about advancing his own reform program for German music, in part articulated in his plan for the Goethe Stiftung. Liszt's background as writer, Wagner's model, uh, broader practices of the time may have helped motivate him to deploy his pupils as what I call Federkrieger, uh, battlers or, or warriors of the pen, and to turn the Altenburg into a publicity of office of sorts, yet they did not engage in a concerted promotional activity until after 1853. Before then, the Weimar Circle produced writings in a variety of publications, usually as reviews of new music or reports from Weimar. Moreover, these critics like Liszt contributed to papers based in Weimar, whether the Weimarische Zeitung, the Weimarer Sonntagsblatt, or Deutschland, not infrequently providing concert and opera previews for the local audience. An exception to the local and relatively uncoordinated early promotional activity of the Weimar Circle was the Lohengrin premiere coverage Liszt promised to Wagner in a letter from September 2nd, 1850. According to it, he would publish something in the Journal des Débats, Ulig would write for Brendel's journal, and Raff would contribute notices for Brockhaus's journal and the Leipzig Illustrierte Zeitung. Bulow's was the first progressive voice from Weimar um, Circle to occupy multiple columns and issues in the Neue Zeitschrift. And here is simply a chart of how the Weimar Circle then did contribute uh, progressively, so we might want to keep that in mind. Um, and his first piece was the hard-hitting huh, Entgegnung auf die in Nummer 24 der Grenzboten erschienene Beurteilung Richard Wagners in October 1851. The writing gained Wagner's praise, who had corresponded with Bülow since 49 and was a colleague in Zurich in 1850. As the identity of the boys from Weimar, as they sometimes called themselves, firmed up in their music critical activities, Bülow adopted the literary pseudonym Peltast, Greek word for heavily armed foot soldier. And there are two, Peltesta. Um, he would indeed become the assassin, brought in to fight the opponents with mockery, both subtle and obvious, and not by weight of aesthetic persuasiveness. Thus, Raff, Raff characterized Bülow's manner of criticism in an unpublished letter from late 1853 with the following words. This manner of warfare, where you sneak up in disguise alongside your opponent and stick the knife between his ribs, is quite suitable for Bülow. <laughs> the next list associate to report on Wagner is Richard Pohl, the Ältester Wagnerianer, according to the composer. And quite an interesting figure who managed to support Wagner, Liszt, Berlioz, and Schumann with support, approval from each of them. In comparison uh, with Bülow, a Pole availed himself of Hoplit, lightly armed foot soldier. And I sometimes wonder because his, the word Hoplit is a quasi anagram for Pole, but that's neither here nor there, and under which name he signed the two-part review of Tannhäuser in Dresden from October 1852. About it, Wagner wrote to Ulig, the article from Dresden about Tannhäuser is quite good. He didn't know that it was Pole. If Bülow was the specialist assassin brought in on occasion for the tough fight, I would compare Pole with the scrappy street fighter who, by virtue of tenacity and ubiquity, attempted to wear down the opposition. He tended to avoid the dis 
the detailed aesthetic debates over Wagner's writings and music, which may have well protected Pohl from the composer's distrust or wrath. And then there was Joachim Raff. And who would do a caricature of Raff? I'm not sure, but I did find it on the internet. Um, who was on good terms with Wagner early on, and then, in part because of overweening ego, one of the composer's targets for criticism. After all, the Liszt pupil presumed to take issue with Wagner. In the lead article on the Redaktion der Neuen Zeitschrift für Musik from February 11, 1853, Raff accused Wagner of running the risk of, quote, erroneously entering the dead end of an almost local Deutsch tomb, end quote. The editor, Brendel, pulled a Brendel with this controversial article. He remarked in the Anmerkung der Redaktion that, quote, we cannot agree in general with the views expressed above, but something seems to us more, but nothing seems to us more suitable than a contradiction raised from a related standpoint, end quote. That Brendel was then to take up the issue in detail in the next issue with the first of his Zonderkunst series did not mollify Wagner, for whom Raff was, quote, most highly narrow-minded, unproductive, cold, mannerist, and incapable of proper understanding, end quote. In that same letter from February 2nd, Wagner makes an important point to editor Brendel, quote, it really isn't necessary that you publish so much about me. We have to wait for the understanding of the content of my works, of that which I desire, until it is possible to bring the form that I use to clear realization." End quote. Despite Wagner's comments on Roth and journal coverage, Brendel continued to deploy Roth and went ahead with his own Wagner promotion, bolstered by the Weimar Circle. With Ulig dead from tuberculosis at the very beginning of 53, Wagner's literary production dramatically reduced after 52, and Brendel having to open a new Kriegsfront with the rising opposition to Weimar, the time was rife for a shift in focus from Wagner to Liszt in the Neue Zeitschrift. But where had Liszt been in all of this? His substantial 1851 essay on Lohengrin did receive the composer's gratitude for Liszt's, quote, untiring enthusiasm, but as Vachonyi observes, quote, Wagner's letters to Ulig on the subject never fail to belittle Liszt's efforts or express bemusement, end quote. Wagner was not amused over Liszt's position in the Goethe Stiftung writing from 1851, about which he responded in a letter to Liszt from May 10th, 1851. Uh, that it only appeared in Brendel's journal on March 5th, 1852 is another issue. In the letter, he essentially rejected Liszt's plan for the Goethe Stiftung, including the annual prize for the best new work, which Wagner called hard to translate, eine Kunstlotterie unter der Firma Goethe, uh, an artistic lottery under the company of, or the firm of Goethe. Instead, Wagner proposes the Originaltheater concept, which he had already developed in the Ein Theater in Zürich. Here's another example of how Wagner could not broach contradictory positions in promotion, although he had to tread carefully with this particular apologist and we heard about his close relationship with Liszt earlier on, especially early on. Uh, Liszt replied that he will nevertheless proceed with the Goethe Stiftung plan, which he felt best served the cause, and it never came to fruition. In an interesting reversal of promotional strategies, it was Liszt who suggested Wagner publish his letter from May 10th. From Liszt on down, Wagner's Weimar Leipzig apologists after 1853 seemed to be pursuing their own agenda in literary promotional activities, which I have elsewhere called the Weimar dialect in the language of publicity. Retrospectively writing in 1853, um, Pohl well summarized this new role for Liszt and the Listians in the progressive movement, quote, when Richard Wagner had to flee the Vaterland, he laid his major work in the most worthy hands. 
Liszt took over the mission of his great friend. He carried it out with amazing energy, with the most faithful dedication, with total success. Liszt became and remains our head, our leader, our model, end quote. Already on his own in October of 1853, Liszt could flex his muscles as publicist and demonstrate how he could mobilize his own press office on the occasion of the Karlsruhe Music Festival. He deployed on-the-spot reporters, Pohl and the newly arrived Peter Cornelius, secured journals and newspapers to carry festival notices, and even engaged in a published cover-up of the conducting scandal or disaster. For his part, Brendel carried on his own brand of Wagner promotion, but in the broader context of the progressive movement Fortschrittspartei, which subsumed Liszt and his Weimar circle, and for which they actively worked, including Liszt himself, in the Neue Zeitschrift essays from 54 through the end of 55. And, faute de mieux, Wagner continued, continued contributing to the Neue Zeitschrift into the late 1850s with the odd open letter, including the important missive of 1857 about Liszt's symphonic poems. In the end, we could say that Wagner's complaints of mispromotion about his non ulig publicists from the early 1850s were justified from his perspective if we accept Vachonnet's compelling reading of Wagner's principles and practices of self-promotion. However, we must also recognize that regardless of Wagner's strategies and opinions, his cause was being served in the early 1850s by a collection of writers on music, Musikschriftsteller, who represented divergent promotional perspectives that would coalesce around Liszt in Weimar and Brendel in Leipzig. The march of musical progress would proceed, but to a different tune. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very nuanced reading. Do we have any questions? Questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, I think you're absolutely right about Brendel's ambivalence. And I think if you look at the New Year's editorial, New Year's greeting, or whatever you call that, from 1851, 1852, 1853, you see a gradual increase in the eye, in the, in the passion, so to speak, and in the commitment to Wagner. Right. So my question is, uh, given that, what, can you account for the re reasons why Brendel would have published so much of Uli? I mean, he literally took everything. Well, I mean, part of it, I think, was an honest sense that he did not understand what it was about and that he really, um, he, he pointed out several times that he had not seen or heard, well, first of all, he hadn't seen Wagner's writings and then he hadn't heard the work, Wagner's work until Lohengrin and thus he was unwilling himself to take that particular to take up those issues. On the other hand, he recognized Ulig's closeness to Wagner, and in fact, uh, I think as you point out, it might as well have been Wagner himself writing several of those Ulig pieces. So um, it's, it's uh, interesting or curious, though, that Brendel himself would not have entered the fray earlier, you know, all things considered. But Ulig was also, I mean, he, I, I'm sure that Brendel wa recognized Wagner's importance and wanted to curry his favor. So for him to reject Ulig, I think, would have been uh, a, a bad, strat bad boo. Yeah. And keeping in mind that a name like Wagner, however controversial he might have been in 1850, did attract a certain readership. And their controversy counted, too. Uh, Celia? Um, thank, thank you, Jim, for, for a really interesting paper. Um, something that always surprised me um, reading in this journal, um, because in the 80s, um, musicologists felt such a need to rehabilitate the Schumann symphonies, mm -hmm. but um, the Neuhead Zeitschrift was so positive about Schumann. Um, you know, and um, I wondered if you knew when that kind of stopped, because I remember, you know, I remember reading some very positive articles about his symphonies. And 
Um, well, of course, Brendel took over in 45 and needed to distance himself from Schumann. I mean, it was a difficult balancing act because he, uh, uh, he was still in correspondence and friendship with Schumann, yet needed to distance himself from the former direction, which he clearly established in his New Year, in his uh, introductory essay from January 1st, 45. But there were some fairly negative things. Julia Schubring, for example, uh, no, wait, uh, you have, uh, mm, there are several people who took a fairly dim view on Schumann uh, in the, let's say, around 1850. Part of it revolved around the opera Genoveva and uh, the difficulties of that work. So I would actually have to say that the job of Schumann was rebuilding Schumann uh, after his death. And it's interesting to see the, the necrology. Schumann own, did not get a major article in the Neue Zeitschrift upon his death. He got a, what do you call that, a black box? <laughs> a, a, a notice. And this was one thing that Clara could never forgive, was that Schumann did not get a full uh, eulogy. Uli gets a five-page spread <laughs> in 1853. So, I mean, I think, though, that it's then after that, uh, the Schumann had, was distant enough that he could afford to perhaps embrace him a bit more. So, that uh, is my perspective. Celia first. Really more point of information than anything. Uh, I'm just interested in what you know about the shifting readership of these various journals. But I mean, that movement, and a slide you didn't much talk about, but where you list them all and what they were writing for before they shifted over to Neuert Zeitschrift. So uh, I'm curious, about, I mean, it's a period of kind of instability in the relationship of these journals to the national movement somewhat. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything that you could tell us about where these journals and writers stood in regards to the public? The um, public. Yeah, I, I, there is, I mean, we, uh, we often see the mistake made that the readership or the circulation is often overblown compared with uh, Dresdner Anzeiger or whatever, or the Leipziger Illustrierte. The Neue Zeitschrift was relatively small in its, uh, in its readership. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that it's interesting that they contributed to a journal like Zignala that would change its position. But I think that uh, Pohl writing, I mean, one thing that they were aware of was the fact that the dailies had much more clout than the music journals, even though I think there was a greater emphasis perhaps on on rebuilding with the Kunstnation and all of that, that the journals then uh, began to uh, maybe potentially gain in readership. Unfortunately, these figures are all but uh, inaccessible. But the fact that uh, Pohl could write in the Dresdner Abendpost, for example, where Wagner had written before, I think that was a coup. And thus, um, and in fact, I think the, op the Grenzboten had a much larger circulation, oh, I know that it did, the oppositional paper than the Neue Zeitschrift. So uh, I wish we had those figures, but uh, many things come together to suggest that, um, that the word was getting around, but, um, but this, uh, pub uh, this, can we say, promotion that used both the musical press, the narrow musical, and then the broader daily press was, I think, essential for, for these battles. And they didn't just uh, altogether focus on the Neue Zeitschrift. They continued to place articles wherever they could. And thus, at the time of the Karlsruhe Festival, they tried to place articles in the local uh, newspapers around there to get the public then uh, uh, to inform them, because who had heard list at that point, you know? So, sorry for a, a long answer that's kind of, but it's a good question. Sana, did you have a question? Just to add um, about Schumann and in the Neue Zeitschrift that if he didn't get a good obituary, um, List really made up for it uh, later with a very, mm. very long <laughs> and very, very generous um, assessment of Schumann. Yes, that's true. Both Clara and Robert. Tom? Yeah, just a further small footnote on, on the Schumann question. Um, uh, didn't Ulig write um, something uh, I think positive and, and kind of interesting about the third symphony, the Schumann, the Rhenish symphony, um, 
at the same time that these, uh, you know, the Wagner sort of pre-publication excerpts were coming out. Do you, do you remember? I can't remember. It's in the context of something out it's, else. It's not a, just a standalone piece. Mm -hmm. But I wondered uh, if, uh, I just wondered if that actually had occasioned any discussion in his correspondence with Wagner, because, you know, Wagner never has really much of anything to say about Schumann at all once he's done trying to get his, you know, his name into the Neue Zeitschrift early on. Well, um, what you bring up is an interesting point about Ulig's activities, because he's also reviewing opera and not just music dramas, and that is by local uh, composers and not unfavorably. So it seems as if Ulig may have this other life, which Wagner only peripherally mentions. But also, I mean, you know, he was still interested in promoting at least the possibility of um, instrumental music, you know, after Beethoven, at the same time yes. that he was supposed to be acting as the mouthpiece for the, you know, the opera and drama theories. So he didn't, he had, he maintained a little bit of critical autonomy in those last years. Uh, did you want to say no, something? No, 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 no. <laughs> You're our Ulig specialist. No, no, no. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Ulig is a really fascinating figure that one dismisses perhaps all too readily as simply, you know, the mouthpiece for Wagner. But there are these various occasions where he seems to, with with Stan, and in the Schumann case, as you mentioned, yes. Any more questions? Okay, then. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.